Hey, you guys. So you know how you asked uh, the question about sleep, and um, I posted on Facebook saying that um, I'm going to be talking to Dr. Bruce about sleep uh, because he's a leading personality when it comes to sleep in the United States. And so many of you have posed questions, and so I got in today to talk to us. We've got about 20 minutes to do this interview, so I want to just jump straight into it. But I want to just tell you very quickly about um, who he is. And so just kind of like, this is a very formal one, so I'm going to do an informal one. Um, yes, he's a clinical psychologist with a diploma from the American Board of Sleep Medicine and a fellow of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. It's all very serious stuff. And, uh, but you know what, the stuff that I like the most, uh, Dr. Bruce, is that you, you train sleep doctors, consultants, but you also work with um, celebrities. Like, can you tell us more about that? <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, it's, I'm joking. <laughs> it's pretty interesting stuff, let me tell you. And I know you're also training pilots and people in the, um, in the industry to really help them improve sleep. And so um, you're obviously the person, and you've been on Dr. Oz like multiple times and, and yep. all that really good stuff. So that's the official stuff. Let's get that out of the way. I really want to talk <laughs> to you about the stuff that my audience is struggling with, right? Okay. And so, you know, we've got so many questions, but I want to kind of start off on the, on the higher level first. Sure. Um, and that is, you know, this, we hear there's a lot of connect, there's a big connection between sleep and chronic disease, right? right. Um, inflammation in the body. And I want to kind of start it from there first before we talk about hormones and address all the questions that came in through, through Facebook. So, sure, sure. So here's the thing about sleep and inflammation. So the more sleep deprived a person is, the more we have of what's called C-reactive protein in our system. And then that leads to overall inflammation across all areas of the body. In fact, there's even some consideration that that level of inflammation could be contributing to something called sleep apnea, which I know we're going to talk about a little bit later. But for folks who don't know, sleep apnea is a situation where your throat literally collapses onto itself. And so one of the ideas we're thinking about is some level of inflammation is actually making the throat even more narrow as it is right now. But we have to think about what is sleep deprivation because actually it's different for everybody. So I'm a six and a half hour sleeper, but my wife is an eight and a half hour sleeper. If she slept six and a half like me, she'd be devastated. If I tried to sleep eight and a half, I'd feel terrible. So it's really about finding out what is your sleep need number not like the bed but more like what is your sleep need and i've got an interesting technique that everybody can actually do tonight to figure out how to figure out what is your sleep need awesome. so super quick we know that the average sleep cycle is approximately 90 minutes long and we know the average person has five of those so five times 90 is 450 and that equals approximately seven and a half hours of sleep so first thing is eight hours is a myth all right Mm. Not everybody needs eight hours. That's from a study that was done in the 40s. We now know that people need various amounts of sleep. So what I want people to do is most people have to wake up at least during the week at the same time just about every day. I have to because of work or getting the kids ready for school, things like that. So let's say, for example, you have to wake up at 630. Well, we know that the sleep cycles are going to be about seven and a half hours. So count backwards from 630 and that's 11 o'clock. That is your new bedtime. I want everybody out there to try to go to bed around 11 o'clock if you wake up at 6.30. Do this for seven to 10 days, and if you should start waking up without an alarm. As soon as you realize that you're waking up without an alarm, you've now found your sleep need number and the appropriate bedtime. Huh. What a Pretty amazing, cool. right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, awesome. it's super easy, super cool, and it works really well. So once you do that, then you're not going to have to worry as much about being sleep deprived. But let's talk about sleep deprivation for just a little bit here. Sleep deprivation is different for everybody, right? So if you're not meeting that sleep need that we just talked about, you will be sleep deprived. Now, some people will only lose 30 minutes of sleep towards their deprivation at night. Some people may lose three hours. That's a very, very big difference. We know that chronic sleep deprivation so more than an hour of sleep off of your sleep need for a period of time over two weeks, you are officially sleep deprived, okay? Now, that can come in lots of different forms. You could have a hard time driving. You could have making poor decisions. You could become moodier, things of that nature. So I want people to kind of think through the idea of what is it that's going to make me sleep deprived and then how can I try to avoid that because with even 
chronic sleep deprivation or acute sleep deprivation, we see all the inflammatory properties come to rise in our bodies. Quick question here for you. So are you saying we should be waking up without alarm? I am. Um, most people should not be needing an alarm clock. You should wake up within five minutes before your alarm goes off every day. I'll tell you this. I haven't used an alarm in almost 15 years because I'm very consistent with my sleep schedule. Kind of drives my wife crazy. But uh, it, it works really well for me. I know what time I need to go to bed. I know what team I, time I need to wake up. I wake up around 6.30. I go to bed right around midnight because, again, I'm a six and a half hour sleeper and it works just great for me. Awesome. So let's, um, let's talk about, you know, I'm really interested in you because that's really the space that we are in. What are the consequences of sleep deprivation in the long term? Let's say in women specifically, because that's my audience, um, right. you know, 35 to 65 audience. Mm -hmm. So one of the big things that um, I learned, I actually wrote an entire book on it, was the effect of sleep deprivation on weight loss or weight gain. Wow. Many people have no idea, but if you are chronically sleep deprived, four different things happen from a hormonal perspective that are important. So number one, when you're sleep deprived, your cortisol levels will raise. Um, they will raise not only in the mornings when they're supposed to, but they will also stay raised in the evening, which makes it very difficult to fall asleep. But one of the things that people may not remember is that cortisol also stimulates appetite right? And so all of a sudden, I'm sleep deprived, I've got a little bit more appetite going on. We all have probably experienced that because at certain times when we're sleep deprived, what do we do? We grab some cake or some cookies or a muffin or a candy bar or something like that. I'll explain to you why that happens in just a second. The second thing that happens is our metabolism slows down the more sleep deprived we are. And there's a very specific reason for this. So the body is trying to hold on to resources, right? Which is fat, which are carbohydrates, anything that's in there because it's worried it's going to run out of fuel because you're up too long. So it holds on to everything by slowing down that metabolism. Huh. So that's not good because we've got high appetite and low metabolism. Already not the best scenario. Two specific hormones do something very interesting. One is something called leptin, and this is a hormone that actually makes you feel full. 15% reduction in leptin, and then ghrelin, which is the hormone that makes you want to eat more, 20% increase. So again, it's this whole idea of the body wants to get resources in, so it's making you want to eat. The final straw is our cravings change. So what happens is because of this heightened cortisol, lowered metabolism, more appetite, all these things going on, our brain says, whoa, this is enough. I don't want any more of this. So it makes you crave high carbohydrate, high fat foods. What those do is they release something called serotonin in your brain, and that's the calming hormone, right? That's the thing that relaxes you the most. And so your brain is naturally trying to relax itself by eating these high carbohydrate, high fat foods. So many people may not know this, but you could be on a diet and if it's not effective, look at your sleep and do that whole bed bedroom calculation that I just talked about earlier, because that's gonna help you a whole bunch. Yeah, awesome. And you know, I feel like we are like on Dr. Oz here. <laughs> and this is your Dr. Oz training. <laughs> well, I've been on the show over 30 times, so it's definitely been helpful. Um, so, you know, one of the biggest questions that we're getting from, from women is, I wake up in the middle of the night and mm -hmm. I can't go back to sleep. What's right. going on? So this is really interesting. So we actually did a whole talk about this um, very thing in the summit um, where we talk about blood sugar. So one of the things that we think could be going on here is that um, if people are not having a steady run of blood sugar while they're awake, um, their blood sugar can, can fall, which causes them to wake up because their body's like, what's going on? There's not enough fuel going on here. And I think that leads to the, to the big misconception that when you, when you sleep, it's not like you're pulling your car into the garage and turning off the engine and letting it sit overnight. Your body is very, very active while you are sleeping. Your brain is active, your metabolism is active. All these things are still going on. It's not like you're hibernating. All of these things need to occur, and if they don't occur at a fairly regular rate, you got a problem. So with blood sugar, if your blood sugar is up and down, up and down all day long, when it goes down when you sleep, it bottoms out, and that's one of the key reasons we think that people have a tendency to wake up in the middle of the night. So in order to get rid of that problem, one of the things I ask my patients to do is about an hour before bed, I want them to make about a 250 calorie snack. 
okay? Now the snack, would I would want it to be about 60 to 70% carbohydrates and about 25 to 30% protein. So a perfect example of that might be cheese and crackers, right? Or uh, a bowl of cereal with, with milk or something along those lines. Now I know some people might be paleo or gluten-free or things like that, and you can kind of work through that, but just about a 250 calorie snack right before bed has a greater tendency to have people push themselves all the way through the night. So I'm hearing you say, do not eat sugar before bed. You want to try to avoid, you know, you don't want to eat a donut, you know, with icing and stuff like that on it, right? That's not going to be very good for you. You really want to do something that can level out your blood sugar. Oatmeal with some bananas in it would be a perfect example of what I would want you to do. So what about people who are going through trauma or stressful times? Does that warrant waking up in the middle of the night sometimes? It can. Um, so there's two things that happen with people when they're dealing with some level of trauma. And actually, we talked about this. I've got two different trauma experts uh, at the summit who are talking. One is talking about grief and the others are talking about emotional trauma. And so there's two things that seem to happen to a person's sleep during this period of time. Number one is an inability to fall asleep, right? So they just can't turn off their brain. They're thinking about this event that occurred or it's an anniversary of the event that occurred a long time ago, something like that. And, and that's very difficult. And then sometimes they wake up in the middle of the night. They're not really sure why. And the event pops into their head. And then all bets are off. Their autonomic nervous system increases. Their sympathetic tone goes crazy. And then they're up for the night. So a couple of things that people should think about uh, I created this technique and it's called the power down hour. So right before bed, like so in our example earlier where you're waking up at 6.30 and you're going to bed at 11, then about 10 o'clock, here's what I want you to do. Take 20 minutes to do the stuff you just got to do before the next day. So in our house, we get the kids' backpacks ready, we pack lunches, we find their shoes, you know, stuff that parents always do. Then you take 20 minutes for, for your hygiene at night. Brush your teeth, wash your face. Um, if you can, taking a hot bath or shower can be very, very effective for sleep, um, especially if you can put some Epsom salt with a little magnesium or a little bit of lavender in there. That can be really, really helpful for people. And then take the final 20 minutes lying in bed in the dark and do some type of meditation or relaxation. It can be prayer. Uh, it can be whatever works for you. But the object of the game here is to slow your body down. Yeah. Remember, sleep is not an on-off switch. It's more like slowly pulling the foot off the gas and slowly putting your foot on the brake. There's a process that needs to occur, and breathing turns out to be one of the most important things. Many people don't know this, but you cannot enter into sleep with a normal resting heart rate. Your heart rate actually has to decrease. Oh. The quickest way to decrease your heart rate is to do relaxing, deep breathing. So one of the techniques that I have a tendency to use with my patients is where they breathe in, counting to five, they hold it for a count of four, and they breathe out in a count of seven. So it's called five, four, seven breathing, right? So in for five, hold it for four, out for seven. And they do a very relaxed, very calm, it's super relaxing, it lowers your heart rate, and once you reach that level, then you have a much greater likelihood of going into sleep. Yeah. You can actually do this technique in the middle of the night. So when people wake up in the middle of the night, a couple of things that they want to think about. So number one, are they hungry? If they're hungry, that means their blood sugar is low. And so they should, you know, in the future, maybe keep some crackers or something like that by the bedside to be able to get that blood sugar to be able to even out. Um, number two, if you don't have to go to the bathroom, don't. One of the biggest mistakes that my patients make in the middle of the night is they say, well, I'm up, I might as well go pee. Not the thing that you want to be doing because what happens is as soon as you sit up, your heart rate goes up, right? Mm -hmm. And your parasympathetic tone increases because you got to get out of bed and start walking around. You've basically just told your body it's almost morning. Mm -hmm. Then they walk into the bathroom, they turn on the light to go to the bathroom, and now all that light has come in and they've definitely told their brain it's morning. Yeah. So strategically place some night lights in your bathroom and in your hallway so that way if you do have to get up and go to the bathroom, you can go there without turning on the light and come back, do the deep breathing, and you should actually feel pretty good. If your mind is still racing and you just can't get through it, here's my other super simple technique that people can use. This is going to sound crazy, but I promise you it works really well. Count backwards from 300 by threes. <laughs> okay? So it sounds nuts. So try it, right? So you go 300, 
297, 294. Oh my God, that's so tiring. So here's what it is. It's mathematically so complicated, you can't think of anything else, and it's so doggone boring, you're out like a light. <laughs> it works like a charm. I use it myself. Oh, oh my God. This, I never heard of this. I remember like, you know, counting uh, sheep or yeah. cows or whatever, but that was like, I was just too tuned out, and yeah, yeah. I, this is brilliant. Thank you. Totally you know, you mentioned the summit, so I just want to, because we haven't introduced the summit. So the summit right. registration is just down below this page, right? And those are free talks that's going to be happening from August 8th, 8th to the 15th. Right. And, um, and it's just incredible content. And so we've got about 20 minutes allocated today for this conversation. There's only so much we can talk about versus... How many hours of content you've got there? Almost 40 or so? Almost 40 hours of right. content. So, so I want to just, just get through a couple of other things because this is really amazing content already. So you just imagine what you're going to get from the, the, the 40 hours of um, that free conversations um, and content. You know, actually, as you were talking about waking up, because the waking up in the middle of the night, that was probably the biggest issue that women were post, ladies were posting. And yep. one of the questions that was really, and this is actually my own curiosity question is, sure. You know, in Chinese medicine, they see, um, it depends if kind of like Ayurveda will say something different, Chinese medicine will say something different. If you wake right. up at one or three o'clock in the morning, it could be the role of your liver, it could be the role of your kidneys that are in trouble. Yeah. What's your take on that? So I'm not a Chinese medicine expert um, or an Ayurveda expert, and I have great respect for both of those disciplines. And so what I always do is I, I would listen to what they have to say and kind of try to understand it and look at some of the techniques that they might have there. Um, my guess is, is those techniques will fall right in line with some of the things that we were just talking about, right? Which is relaxation, deep breathing. Um, and, and for some people, it may actually have to do with the foods that they're eating during the day, or maybe some of the supplements or even the use of essential oils. As a matter of fact, we have an entire talk um, on essential oils by Dr. Eric Zielinski about mm. oils and sleep. So that's something that people might find um, kind of fascinating there. We also have a Chinese medicine expert who's going to be talking about Chinese medicine and sleep as well. Oh, awesome. That's really, that's very, really, it's going to be very revealing. I'm going to tune into that. Um, another one that's really a big one that's been coming up from a lot of ladies is sleep apnea question. Sure. What is the reason behind it? Because we always want to know the reason, right? Right. So sleep apnea um, most times is anatomical, meaning that there's some stump there. Well, I'm sorry. Let me back up. There's two types of sleep apnea. There's central sleep apnea where your brain tells your lungs don't breathe. That's very serious and very difficult to treat. Then there's something called obstructive sleep apnea. And that's where there's actually a physical blockage in your throat. Now that can occur for one of many different reasons. And interestingly enough, the ratio of men to women for sleep apnea, it's usually two men for every one woman that has sleep apnea until they reach menopause. And then as soon as they reach menopause, those ratios are identical. We think it has to do with the hormone changes as well as the weight gain that can be associated with menopause. Now that also brings up an important point in that sleep apnea is not just a big person's disease. While I can tell you that if you have over an 18 inch neck, you have an 84% chance of having sleep apnea, which by the way is the largest physical marker in all of medicine. You don't have to have that size of a neck in order to be suffering from sleep apnea. You can have big tonsils, big adenoids, you can have extra tissue back there. And so one of the things I talk about with people is think about your symptoms. If you're tired during the day, if you snore, if somebody has ever told you that you stop breathing in your sleep, any of those three, you should talk with your doctor about maybe even considering a sleep apnea test or being able to learn a little bit more about sleep apnea because it is a disease that can cause significant issues. One of the issues is uh, something called refractory hypertension, which is hypertension that does not react well to medication. Um, it can cause very odd um, heartbeat, something called atrial fibrillation, which is very difficult to treat. Uh, it can also cause stroke. Uh, it can also cause death. So if you have any suspicion of having sleep apnea, you absolutely should talk with your physician and get referred to a sleep specialist who can then do the appropriate testing. And there are several different treatment protocols for sleep apnea, specifically obstructive sleep apnea. There's something called a CPAP machine, which is a mask that you wear on your nose. So remember, your throat has collapsed. So we have to do something to open your throat. So all a CPAP machine is, is it's like a hair dryer, right? It's a little air compressor that shoots a thin stream of air through a tube 
to a mask that sits on your nose. When that air goes down to that blockage, it just ever so slightly opens it up, allows you to breathe, you sleep all night long. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not the sexiest thing in the world to sleep with a mask on your face. I get it. But it's better than being dead. Um, and it's better than, and it, by the way, it knocks out all of your snoring, which isn't the sexiest thing in the world either. So that can be one option. Another option is something called an oral appliance or a dental piece. For some people, if we bring the jaw forward, it actually opens up their airway that way. And so you may have seen athletes where they have a mouth guard, right? This is one that's an upper and a lower, and the lower one can be pushed forward very gently, doesn't hurt or anything like that, opening up your airway that way. The third option is something uh, is surgical, uh, where we see people actually having full-on sleep apnea surgeries where they actually cut in and pull all the tissue out. That is really a last resort. It is super painful, uh, and half the time the tissue grows back. So are there any nutritional, sol nutritional solutions for addressing sleep apnea, or do you see any, for example, people having a poor diet um, that causes sleep apnea or, may or aggravates it? We've never been able to nail down any real dietary issues surrounding sleep apnea in particular. However, if you are somebody who has a gluten sensitivity and you know that that causes inflammation, if I had to guess, I would say that that inflammation could also be in the throat and could be causing some of those issues as well. So any of the diets that are out there or things actually, Magdalena, that you're recommending for people to help them reduce that inflammation, I think that could help with sleep apnea. Yeah, thank, so thank you for mentioning that because I mean, yeah, gluten is one thing. Dairy is obviously another highly inflammatory thing for, for some Absolutely. women, right? So I think the last thing I want to pick your brain on is, a, is another point that um, a number of ladies brought up and that is how to shut your brain off <laughs> and this is an inability of going to sleep where your brain is just running crazy. What are the potential causes and how do we address it? So in, for some people, um, well, first of all, let me tell you that that is completely normal, okay? So think about it, right? You've been working all day. People have been asking you questions. You've been running errands. You're dealing with your partner, your, your kids, your dogs, whatever, whatever. It's too busy to really sit and think. The first time that you actually get an opportunity is when you're lying in bed when the lights are off and nobody's talking to you, then all the thoughts come flooding in. That's a perfectly normal situation. So first of all, for anybody out there who's experiencing that, that's the way it's actually supposed to be, okay? So don't worry about it like you're not, there's nothing abnormal about you for, for that occurring. The second thing to remember is, is that the, a lot of those thoughts can be anxiety provoking, right? And so what a lot of people will do is they'll be thinking about their day and they'll say, oh my gosh, I forgot to do this. Um, I, I'm going to think about it because I don't want to get out of bed and write it down on a, on a piece of paper, right? Or they'll say, oh my gosh, I've got a big presentation. I want to add this. And they'll think about it, think about it, trying to, you know, get that burn it into their brain, right? That's the last thing that you want to do right before bed. So what I ask my patients to do is about an hour and a half to two hours after dinner, is to sit down with a journal and write down and spend a half an hour and write down every single thing that's going on for them and one solution. Now, it doesn't have to be a grand solution. It could be, I'm going to think about this tomorrow at three o'clock. That's okay too. Yeah. It's called a worry journal. And what's great about it is once you've got it on paper and you've got some level of a plan or something actionable to do about it, that helps reduce that level of stress. And then when you're in bed at night, even if that thing pops up, you can say, you know what? I wrote it on my journal. I know what my plan is to do tomorrow. I'm going to do that. Then also, the other thing I like to have people do is right before bed, I ask them to, to journal, but I ask them to do a different kind of journaling. I ask them to do gratitude journaling right before bed. Um, I find that when you're thinking about some positive things and good things that are happening in your life, number one, your dreams are a lot better, but number two, you have a much greater likelihood of falling into a deeper sleep and turning off your brain. Aww. That's so nice. Yeah, it works. Yeah, yeah. No, this is awesome. And just a great reminder of just, I mean, this gratitude thing, it's like everybody talks about it. And yeah. But this is a way to use gratitude to actually help you sleep better. So yeah. even more reason to do it. It's awesome. This was really great. And, you know, I just want to mention also um, what we talked about is like you have a whole day for women's health and sleep allocated at the summit, right? So that's going to be specifically, and you know, for women and sleep, right? And so, right. Um, and so that's really huge. And, you know, like I mentioned to you earlier that nobody asked about how do I, or what's the connection between sleep and weight? And I right. realized that 
I think most of the women do not understand the connection, that there is a big connection. Instead, we focus on the methods that we've been taught, and that is counting calories and exercising like crazy. So I'm really grateful that you mentioned that at the beginning of this conversation about the role of cortisol, leptin, and ghrelin in weight loss. Um, then you and have actually, a key. There's an entire talk on the calorie myth and what are calories and what aren't there. And actually, that's a free giveaway when you register for the talk for the summit is you actually get that talk all about and it's all about sleep and weight loss what is it how does it work also just to let everybody know um, I have an app that's out there and every single person that registers gets the app for free which is a 14 night program on how to sleep better you can download it works on any device it's it's really pretty cool it's got meditations relaxations all kinds of cool fun stuff oh wow that's awesome um, and what's the name of the app? Oh, the, app is called, huh? you know, the app is called Good Night. And as soon as you register, you can link to a page and you can download it right oh, there. And you, okay, okay. got it. Um, I want it. I want it now. You can get one for free, I promise. Okay. Uh, then you also have alternative medicine and biohacking. I do. That's, that's going to so be they, an interesting one. Yeah, there's a full day on alternative medicine where we're looking at things like uh, grounding and earthing and energy levels. We're looking at Chinese medicine. We're looking at meditation. We're looking at, I, I really wanted to kind of bring in the scope of all the different things that are out there so people could, you know, hear from experts and kind of, you know, take what they felt would work for them and, you know, leave the rest. Yeah, I'm totally tuning in. And the last one you mentioned was the trauma and sleep and grief connection to sleep. That's a really, I think for some people, that's going to be a huge one. Um, yeah, we were very fortunate. We had uh, one grief expert and two trauma experts who were willing to do lectures and talk about what to expect from your sleep when you've gone through something like that and different techniques or methodologies that people can use in order to find a way to sleep even when they're dealing with and processing through those traumas. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, and I can definitely relate to this in my own life because my partner went through a lot of trauma while we were in California and we tried yeah. every single solution that you could, like you talked about today and much more. And, um, and it wasn't helping until we got out of California. We moved here to Iceland where we live right now and he sleeps like a baby. And so, <laughs> no, awesome. and it was just getting himself out of that environment that was creating right. all that trauma. That was huge. So I definitely yeah. am looking forward to that talk. Thank you so much. This was really good. Good. I'm glad you liked it. This is this was really awesome. So, um, so everybody, sign up for the link down below. Um, the free talks for Sleep Summit. This is is gonna be a really great one. I, I don't need to. I don't think I need to convince you any further than that. And it's gonna be the usual summit format. You get free talks, and then if you wanna, if you wanna just watch it in your own time, then there is a purchase option. And I think yep. I'm gonna put that link down below. That um, the, my audience knows this. That there's always an option to buy those talks and just watch in your own time. And I'm sure you're gonna transcribe them, right? You've got videos that available and all that good stuff. Yep. So, any yeah. final um, words of wisdom before we chow off? You know, I just would recommend to everybody that you know sleep is important. I think it's kind of the next vital sign for life. And you know, when you're thinking about your health and you're thinking about wellness, you got to think about sleep. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you.